Whoever you're backing to win, get our top prize, guaranteed. Play in-store and online with Betfred. Hello and welcome to the 2022 Betfred World Cup preview show. And I'm joined by Robert Earnshaw, of course, 59 caps and 16 goals for Wales. And Paul Robinson, 41 caps for England. So a little bit of friendly rivalry amongst us in Group B as we look at the World Cup and the groups, which we're going to be chatting through today. Um, we're going to start by looking at the outright betting and try and figure out who might go the distance. I've just mentioned there, Group B, very competitive um, amongst yourself, gents. But as we look initially at the top of the market brazil argentina france england are up there in the top four and the betting one to talk about rob i'll come to you first who instantly flags up as your top contender to go the distance my favorite for the for the world cup um been saying it for probably a year and a half now is argentina um i just think they're they they've got it right they really struggled two years ago everything was in disarray completely lost uh, even Messi quit for a little bit mm. um, and then they turned it around. Scaloni, the manager, came in and then he's got everybody together. They're on this 35 match unbeaten run and now I think they're ready and they're a team. I think uh, with Messi there, I think it's going to be... Uh, the, that, that's my top. Yeah. How much do you think form coming into big competition matters? There's been a lot of chat around England's form. Um, and some have played offers. Don't worry about the recent form. Let's look at the big competition form. How much do you think form coming into a big competition and that togetherness and that vibe around not even the players, but the managers and even the press and the fans, how much does that count? Yeah, momentum helps you without a doubt. But we're in unprecedented territory now with this World Cup. The time of year, the stage of the season. International teams haven't been together for a long time. Normally, as a, at the end of an international break, you'd go, you'd play your last game at home, and then you'd go and you'd leave for a tournament. Teams haven't been together. They're only going to get three or four days to train together to prepare for a game. I mean, we're doing this show in the week leading up to the World Cup. The England manager, for example, Gareth Southgate, will get his team together on Monday. They won't be able to train because of the weekend's fixtures. They'll do a couple of down days, and then it won't be till Thursday, Friday, he starts prepping his team. So it's unusual territory, but I think momentum going into a tournament is huge, like Rob says, with the Argentinians. And I think this year, for some reason, I think it's South America's turn. I like you. I like the Argentinians, but I also like Brazil. I think they're your two bankers, if you like, for, for this tournament. You know, where the, where the tournament is, the climate that the tournament's in, the form of the players. You look at their two squads. I mean, the French are probably the only one that could rival these two squads. But for me, it's going to South America this year. That's a point to touch on, isn't it? The climate and the... It's a very different World Cup. I, I'd be lying if I said I've got World Cup fever just yet because the time of it, where it is, maybe we're slightly detached with a lot of the football that we'll be watching being in Europe. You mentioned the climate. One positive that all players will have, but I think Harry Kane was mentioning, is that they'll be fit and ready. But it's a massive difference from playing in Manchester <laughs> last, <laughs> last couple of weeks to flying over and playing in Qatar, isn't it? I think they've, I've spent a lot of time over there in the last few years and I've seen the way that the, the stadiums and the place has developed. They're experiencing unusually hot weather now. It's normally 10 degrees cooler than it is. So normally they'd be expecting like 25, 26 and the humidity's completely dropped at this time of year. But we've seen at the moment that hasn't come in yet. They're waiting for the humidity drop to drop. And it will be different for the players on, on the training grounds, but not in the stadiums. The, the stadiums are fully air conditioned. I think eventually it, the, the temperatures will drop come towards the end of the tournament. This time of year out there, it's dark at four o'clock. The temperatures are generally 25, 26 degrees. So that it should be quite pleasant. But at the moment, it is unusually hot. But it will be different for the players. Yeah, I mean, on, just on that, climate is key because I looked at the same. You look at, OK, where the, the tournament's been held and the temperatures, it plays a big factor because it's, it's that pre-season feel. When you go, you know, pre-season and all of a sudden you go from, you know, your pre-season training at home to then, bang, you're in 25, 30 degrees heat and uh, there's humidity, uh, players react differently. So I think whoever uh, adapts to that the quickest and the best is, uh, is going to be flying. But also the other thing is, it's, I think because of the lack of pre preparation, it's going to be the individual talent now kicks in. It's not the team and you've had a month to prepare. It's going to be the individuals that t take you through the tournament. The climate's different. The, the training programme will be the one that's affected because the training grounds are all outside, they're all open air. There's only four or five teams that have got their own training ground here. You look into it, most, most teams are sharing three to a training ground. 
so they're not necessarily getting the training times that they want to train. So if the heat and the humidity is playing a factor, which it still is at the moment, teams aren't going to be able to train at the time of day that they want. But then the teams are training and then they go into the stadiums, which are fully air conditioned mm. and playing in a different climate to what they're training in. A very different World Cup, uh, certainly, and climate a, a talking point. And Brazil, Argentina, those South American p teams being two that you've flagged up. Um, Bet Fred, top price on all outright betting markets throughout the World Cup. And here is Matt Hume with those prices. We are top price every single team on this Qatar World Cup. So you don't need to shop around in the village. You know that if you come into your Bet Fred shop, whoever you fancy to win the FIFA World Cup. Uh, in Qatar, we are top price every single team, and here they are in all their glory. Brazil, five-time winners, last victorious back in 2002. They are 4-1 to one for a sixth World Cup crown. Argentina, led by Lionel Messi. Lots of support for them in recent weeks. 11-2, second favourites. The reigning champions, France, are in there at 7-1. to one. Can they follow up four years on? Spain and England, both locked together at 9-1. to one. We've got the Germans, you never rule them out from tournament football. 11 to 1, could look big, couldn't it, come the 18th of December. Their neighbours, Netherlands, are at 14s, as are Cristiano Ronaldo's Portugal, also 14 to 1. It's the final chance for Belgium's golden generation, 18 to 1, to be champions of the world. And many people's idea of the dark horse is Denmark, are at 28 to 1. Doesn't matter who you fancy, you know you will get top price and the best price here with Betfred. Paul, I heard you chatting about uh, we wouldn't quite be in beer gardens drinking beers watching this as England you fans. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a bit different this time of year, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Well, there'll certainly be chance of it's coming home and the nation will obviously, as we always do, get behind England. And there's always that glimmer of, of hope with England because of the quality we have amongst us. At current top price, nine to one. How do you sum that one up, boys? I think there'll be a lot of patriotic betting. I think there always will be. Um, like you said at the beginning of the show, though, we haven't really got into that World Cup fever. Normally we're seeing flags hanging out the windows, people driving the cars with the flags out. And people, whether it's the time of year or what it is, it just doesn't seem like World Cup fever yet. I think we're starting to build up to it now we're into the last week of it. Mm -hmm. But I think from an England point of view, it's going to be tough for them. I really do. I think there'll be a lot of patriotic betting. I don't put them as high up in that table, the betting table for outright winners, as we obviously do. And there will be a lot of betting in this country on the England team. I think there's a lot stronger teams. I think England have struggled when they've played against good opposition. You look at the Euros, they, they haven't played Belgium, they haven't played France, they haven't played Spain. You took the South American teams into that, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, to mention just six teams. It's going to be a very, very difficult ask for England and I think they've got, they've got it all on. I think since the Euros, I think the team's regressed. I don't think they've progressed at all. You look at the Nations Leagues they've played in, he's tried different formations, he's tried different players in attacking places because our strength is an attack but he just hasn't got that right formula you look how long it is since England have scored a goal in open play mm. and that's tough for him so I think he'll revert back to the way they played in the Euros I think he'll go with a back four with the two holding midfielders whether people like it or not that worked for England in the Euros and for me I think we don't appreciate the art of defending in this country, but I think he'll try and nick games 1-0 and get through, as he did in the Euros. Mm -hmm. Just touched on the squad there and, and the tactics that we might employ. Robert, how do you, sit, what do you weigh up the squad since the announcement? There'll be players coming back from tournaments that we have done well in, those big tournaments, but you made a good point that we haven't maybe played some of the top teams and we might have had a smoother run than what we'll get this time round. Are there any surprises, any players you thought might have been playing or you're, you're disappointed or happy that are in? Um, well, the, I think the one that's probably got a, a lot of, uh, I guess, accolades recently is obviously James Madison. Um, I think he deserved to be in. But um, the one I don't get um, is uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold. He's got to play. For me, in my opinion, you have one of the best attacking players. Yes, defensively, yeah, okay, a little bit vulnerable. But he gives you so much going forward. I think there's a, uh, there's a negativity always in England for, to criticize somebody who's actually brilliant and everybody realizes quietly they're brilliant <laughs> but then they don't really want to play them you know like Jude Bellingham is, is another one he's got to play mm -hmm. uh, Foden he's got to play it, it comes a time I think this is a tournament for England that it's a transition now you've got to uh, the Sterlings they've been in tournaments not really performing lately there's got to be now the the changeover to now release your best players mm -hmm. and your best team. And I think Gareth Southgate recently, he's, he's played, he, he loves the back five and, and the three centre-backs. He loves that. That's what he's prepared for. 
Um, so, uh, but I'd love to see him go to a, uh, a back four, but he's not really, I don't think he's going to do that. He's going to go safe. And, um, and obviously attacking wise, the number one is, is Harry Kane. He's, as long as he's fit, England have got a chance. Listen, Trent can't play. Trent, no, Trent can't play. No. The, form <laughs> is, he, the, the form he's in this year, the goals he's cost Liverpool, mm. where he is in his headspace confidence wise, you look at the, the op options that they've got there. Kieran Trippier has been a different class at Newcastle. Carl Walker, if he's fit, is a better defender than him. England are susceptible defensively. What Trent gives you going forward, I completely agree with you. Mm. But I think where he is confidence wise and where he is performance wise, I, you can't play him. I think really? he, England defensively are too susceptible. And I think in Carl Walker and Kieran Trippier, you've got two better defenders and better players than him in that squad. There was talk, if Rhys James was fit, Trent might not have even made the squad. Mm. Yeah, t t I agree with you there. The only reason I say Trent's got to play is I look at the squad now and think, OK. Because well, he wants Wales to win, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trying to sabotage us. Play him, yeah, yeah play him. But Gareth Bale on the left-hand side. <laughs> No, the, the only reason I say that is because I look at the squad and I think, OK, who's your best overall right back? Is Trent Alexander-Arnold better than Trippier? I think so. Um, yeah, probably Trippier is better defensively, but nowhere near a Trent going forward. But if Rhys James was fit, absolutely, he's got to play. and he's the, Who would you like to play against? If you're, you're a left-footed attacker. And not fit. If you're, you're a left-footed attacker like yeah. you were, if on the, you looked at the England team and you saw a right back there, out of all those three right backs, which one is defensively susceptible that you would like to play against? Probably Trent. Yeah, probably <laughs> Trent. I agree. Uh, but uh, this is where I think the tactics and, and the genius, you've got to hide those things because inside football you can hide different things. For example, you keep the ball more. Yeah. Uh, England don't really keep the ball, which is weird because you have all of these top class players in the Premier League, you know, playing at the Man Cities and the Liverpools and then they get into an England shirt and then that... Half of that goes away almost. It's weird. Well, you've got to st still, like things like keeping the ball, you hide defensive, you know, vulnerabilities. Uh, but Trent, um, Reese James uh, is the one, and Cal Walker's not fit. Otherwise, I would say probably Cal Walker think, plays. From ahead. what you said there, do you think Gareth Southgate puts the reins on a little bit, puts the shackles on him? Because Phil Foden is not the same player for England as he is for Man City. Mm. Do you think he's restricted and has to do a little bit more defensive work? In I agree. Yeah. I think he is. Yeah, I agree because I look at an England team and I think they they've got the handbrake on. They're playing with the handbrake on because I look at them and think, okay, you've got some of the best talent. Foden is unbelievable. Even Trent is unbelievable going forward. If I'm Kane, he's a big Trent fan. Yeah. yeah if I'm if I'm Kane, I just think of okay, what, who's your best player? Who's your Biggest uh, yeah, who's, who, who can, talent. Yeah, who's going to carry us forward? You mentioned a few players that, that maybe should or, sh or should or shouldn't be in the squad, but who can we rely on to be our, you know, our flag bearer? Who is, who's plays. the man that we look Declan to? Rice plays. He plays every game. I'd like to see Gareth go away from the two holding midfielders. I'd like to see Declan Rice as a holding midfielder. He will play with one. So I want to see him play with one, Declan Rice. I want to see Bellingham in front of him, Foden in front of him, and then two in behind Harry Kane. More attacking. You look at the group we've got, no disrespect, Wales, Iran, USA, England should be winning that group. The first game against Iran, England need to be looking at what they can do to Iran rather than what Iran can do to England. Defensively, that's strong enough to cope with what they've got to offer. With Rice sat holding, you get as much attacking quality and the best players on the pitch. In 2006 with Sven, we were the so-called golden generation. We were a rigid 4-4-2 or a 4-4-1-1 and he played that system to suit the, the, what he wanted as a system, not the best players. You play a system to suit your players, you get the best players in their best positions. And I think Saka is absolutely brilliantly mm. informed for Arsenal this year, mm. but on the right-hand side. Raheem Sterling is one for me. It was touch and go. I picked this team with Raheem Sterling in it because I think, I think he's the only one that I thought I'll pick him because I think that's what Gareth's going to do. I wouldn't play him at the moment. He has not scored since August. Yeah. I'd change that. I'd maybe put Grealish in there, maybe play Foden, further advanced, put somebody else in. I think Sterling's the one for me that would be touch and go, but I think the England manager will play him because of what he's done for him in the past. I agree with that one. Sterling, for me, doesn't play. Mm. If I was picking the team tomorrow... He's not I, scored since yeah, August, has he? Yeah, he struggled. <laughs> but it's also, if you look back at the last uh, probably six to eight months of his Man City career, never mind moving to Chelsea. Yeah. Chelsea struggled, but Man City as well, he really struggled. So that's over a year that he's really been struggling. And you think even in England shirt, has he contributed? Not really. So I think Sterling can't play, and I, I like Saka. I think he's excellent. He's, he's got to play. He's got to come back with a bit of a point to prove, hasn't he? Because he was brilliant, and then 
finished obviously with in, on penalties. That's that was a big downer. But besides that, and, and that's the moment that everyone looks at, and that'd be hugely a, a big kind of weight to bear as a, a young player. But that's got to add a bit of fuel to his game, I'd imagine, because he was brilliant up until that. Point. Yes, I mean Saka's a brilliant player. I think we all know that. I think what he's added also is he's now a couple of years on. He's, he's mm. oh sorry, a year on, and now he's also maturing. But he's also a young man who those experiences they make you. And you think, okay, how does he react after the missed penalty and the Euros? Well, what's happened is he's actually got better and mm. better. You look at Arsenal this year. He's, his contribution is so big. That's why they're doing so well. So um, I think Saka's brilliant. He's got to play. Kane, of course. Uh, I do like uh, Paul Robinson's um, uh, the, the Bellingham and Foden. Mm. I like that because I think two really good creative, uh, in, but intelligent as well, midfielders. And away from that, two defensive midfielders. That, I, I got think to that get away from that. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't help England. Having a young squad was a talking point for the Euros, wasn't it? I think you just said that you can be young, but once you start getting these big tournaments in, the Euros has got to count for a lot for some of these young players now they've coming back. Now. Yeah, they've got yeah. tournament experience. Mm. I've sat here before at this, this table and, and give a, a comparison to a racehorse. You know, the, the two previous tournaments, England finished semi-final, losing finalists, so third and second, if you like. If they're a racehorse, you back them to win the next race. You, yeah. you, you would. But you look at the, the, the squad, they've got so much more experience. Players have played now in quarterfinals, semifinals, finals. They've experienced been away from home. They've experienced been in training camps. This is a, a, an England team that has got top quality and it's got tournament experience. But I just think that they just lack in certain areas. We've seen in the Nations League games since the last Euros, they've not really gone on to the level you'd expect them to. Mm -hmm. Talking of their opponents, um, looking at the group, plenty of emotional competition almost. Wales is going to be a tough game. USA, you always feel a little bit of a rivalry, I find. Um, maybe just because of English speaking, America wanting to get one up on England. The same goes for Wales, really. They will definitely both be teams that are looking forward to playing in England and trying to cause an upset, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, you look at you look at every team and you think, okay, who's the favourite? Everybody goes for the favourite, and England, of course, will be absolute favourites. They should, they should get out of the group, and probably they should be winning every game. But the the problem with major tournament, um, lack of preparation, the form that England are in. You look at Iran; are they going to be looking at England and thinking, yeah, we, maybe we can get the biggest upset of our our country's uh, mm -hmm. hist World Cup uh, um, history? Yes, they'll be looking at that. And they're dangerous, by the way. They've got a couple of top players. Uh, Teremi at P FC Porto, who's been scoring in the Champions League. Um, uh, and you look at USA. USA have got some top talent as well. I think very, very young. They'll be v a bit vulnerable. But you look at the, every team, and Wales as well. I, I, I look at us and think, um, England game, the last game. It's we're going to fancy game. that, yeah. Mm. And, and you might even see um, Robert Page rest maybe a Ramsey and a Bale thinking yeah because it's so many games in in mm -hmm. what's uh, eight nine days you've got three games so you look at think uh, the England I mean you think he might rest them just for the England game going full out and all out so no chance no chance uh, he's not going to want to if he's not got it done by the England game you boys are coming home <laughs> true. You've and got to win the first two games. Absolutely, you've got to win the first two and games. Nobody in Wales would be yeah. happy with that. I think. I, I think four points for Wales. You're looking at the the group and you think you don't want it to go to the England yeah. game. Absolutely, I think. Neither do England, by the way. Yeah. Neither do England. No, England yeah. Don't there's, want to go to that there's a last game. there's a nervy few games for England, isn't there? We have to Rob get points. About have Iran. to get he's, points. He's early. Bang on with them. You know, you, we we're going out to work at the tournament. We're doing the work. You're doing your research. This Iran team will park the bus. Mm. They won't threaten England, they'll threaten England on the counter-attack, they've got a bit of quality going forward. It's hard to make a case for them, but they'll make it difficult for England. And the longer it goes in that game without England scoring, Iran will park the bus, they'll sit, they'll defend, they'll defend for their lives, and they'll make it hard for England. You look at when England last scored a goal in open play, or how many goals recently mm. they've scored mm. in open play, that's a problem for them. If they go 50, 60, 70 minutes into that Iran game without mm. scoring, it's a different, you know, it's different. And then you go into the USA game, you've got the likes of Tyler Adams, Brendan Aronson at Leeds, They've got a nucleus of a good young team mixed mm -hmm. with experience. Listen, both teams that I've talked about should be nowhere near England, shouldn't be touching England. But there is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a case you can make for both of them. And the Wales game, look at what Scotland did to England in the Euros. I mean, Scotland were hopeless in the Euros, the only point they picked up. Mm -hmm. But because it's England, people raise the game. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that, and you look at that group. USA-England, regardless of what sport it is, there's a rivalry there. Mm -hmm. England-Wales speaks for itself. 
So there's two ridiculously tough games already. Yeah, it's a, it is a very tricky group for, for varying reasons um, that goes beyond almost the football on the pitch, doesn't it? We'll look at the betting in a second, but just quickly, do you see England and Wales as the most likely top two, the pair of you? For me, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, absolutely. I see, you know, probably England winning it, I think, and Wales second. I agree. I think it's going to be tough, though. I can make a case for England not getting out of the group, mm-hmm. but I can also, if, if they turn up and they play well, but you look at the England that played in those Nations League games, it worries me a little bit. Mm-hmm. England and Wales, the most likely to top the group. Um, Here is Matt with the betting. This is it then, the group that everyone is looking at, of course. It's England's group. Group B gets underway on Monday. And what a battle we have got with Wales in there as well. But look, on all known form, Gareth Southgate's men should be coming out top of the pile. And conceivably, really, with three wins from three and nine points. They're four to 11 to win the group. And then... It's a match between USA and Wales, both in there 11 to 2, and Iran at 14 to 1. Can Wales get through to the knockout stages, though? Again, they're in a battle with the USA. With top price, Wales, I'll prove that shortly. 11 to 8, Wales uh, to qualify. England up 1 to 12 if they're in the top two, really speaking, with this group. It's a very favourable draw for England. The 1 to 12 to go through. The Americans next in 21 to 20, but we are top price, Wales. Fingers crossed that Robert Page and Gareth Southgate can go both get their boys through to the last 16, 11 to 8 in Iran at 100 to 30. Well, we've touched on how big it is for Wales to be part of this World Cup and the emotion that will be going into the game against England, but every game is going to be a huge game for Wales and we know that the Welsh will be out in numbers supporting 100%. How much will the players be feeling that? Uh, this is huge for, for everyone in Wales and everybody involved, isn't it? But they're going to be revved up as much as possible for every one of these games and, and looking to pick up points early on. Well, there's been a change over the last few years with Wales because what you look at is 2016 and the tournament and the support that Wales had. We, it took us to a different level. It broke down the wall of... Um, we're nearly there mm-hmm. at tournaments or we, we need, you know, we're just happy to be there. It broke down that wall to now, OK, when we go to a tournament, we're going to be supported um, and we're also going to be competitive as well. And we're going to try and find a way. And Wales is almost like we love being the underdogs. We've got uh, world class players in Ramsey and, and Bale who can produce magic and win a game. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, you've got like, the likes of uh, young Brennan Johnson now playing in the Premier League and Kiefer Moore scoring goals in the Premier League. So you've got a few goal scorers there. So it, Wales are going to be now in, going into this tournament with zero pressure. Uh, and that is sometimes you, that is, gives you an extra lift in, in itself. You've got no pressure. Um, Do you not think there is pressure? If they don't get out of that group, if you like, you, we look at it, Iran well, and USA. Well, that'd be disappointing. Say, and the pressure must be to get out of the group for Wales. Listen, the success is getting out of the group for Wales, but right. there'll be no pressure because people... Um, I think the fans uh, are just very, very much happy that we are seeing Wales at the w- biggest stage at now. The yeah, yeah. We, we're at the tournament. But also, I think there's a quiet belief that, do you know what? we could surprise a few people, absolutely, mm-hmm. like the likes of England. And then as you go on, I mean, look at 2016 when uh, we're in England's group and nobody gave us a chance. We were probably, everybody's, you know, they won't get out, yeah. you know, and um, they surprised everybody. So it's the nucleus is, of the, that team is still there. And obviously the Euros um, last year as well. Um, the only worry is Gareth Bale is not quite fit. Mm-hmm. He's not really 100%. I don't worry as in his mentality is still going to be right. And, you know, my, I picked my team uh, with Hennessy in goals, Connor Roberts, a right back, Rodon, uh, who's now going to play in, in, um, in France, who's been doing very well, um, Ben Davis of Tottenham, uh, Nico Williams of Forest. I think he's, he shouldn't have left Liverpool, to be honest, but I think he's an excellent player. And then Ampadu, Wilson and Ramsey in that midfield. And then Brennan Johnson, Bale on the left and Kiefer Moore. So it's a team set up that you know they're set up for a counter-attack. Um, not so much lots of possession, but they're set up with fast speed, both sides and then the magic of Bale. They've scored goals recently. One against well, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, again against Netherlands, Belgium. I mean, we've touched on Kane, touched on Ramsey. If you look at the betting you'd have Wales to beat Iran, Wales and USA closely matched and England to beat Wales just on on betting alone and and where they're ranked. 
how are they going to score those goals? Who are the players that are going to score them and how are they going to employ the tactics to get those goals, to win, win the games, particularly against Iran and USA? Well, I think, I mean, when you look at the, the teams, I think Iran are going to be thinking, OK, we need to go at Wales a little bit. So it creates that freedom. But I think the key is the midfield for Wales. When you look at Ramsey and whether he plays, um, you know, if it's two holding midfielders and, and one ahead. But the key is Aaron Ramsey because mm -hmm. Aaron Ramsey, in a Wales shirt, he almost becomes this influential. Um, what I love about him is he's never afraid, always wants the ball. And he makes Gareth Bale better. And that's the key. He, he's the one that always, I mean, his running stats are off the charts. But also, he, um, he provides that key passes and that late run into the box. And the amount of big goals and winning goals that he scored over the last five, six years is, is unbelievable. So, I think Aaron Ramsey is key. Um, I think whether it's Dan James or Brennan Johnson, you know, they've been playing and uh, contributing heavily. Whether it's either one of those two, I think... Um, I think they'll be they'll be big, but I think Kiefer Moore playing up front is going to be key to scoring goals because you, you can cross it from anywhere for him. Uh, he's got actually good movement, and he's also one that he takes the pressure off Bale a little bit, takes the attention because he's so physical in the box. I think the thing for Robert Page and Wales is how he manages Ramsey and Bale through the tournament. They're so key to Wales's success. We've seen them in the qualifications. We've seen them in the other games. Those two players are vital for Wales, yeah. aren't they? And you, you see the lift of a team sheet. When the team sheet goes into the opposition dressing room, if there's no Bale on it, there's no Ramsey on it, the opposition get a lift immediately. The big task for Robert Page is his starting 11 pretty much picks itself. I think Dan James could possibly get in there somewhere, but is managing Aaron Ramsey and Gareth Bale through the tournament and getting them as many minutes on the pitch as he can. Wells clearly in with a, a chance. I mean, a great chance. Actually, let's touch on that quickly. We've, we've all in agreement that they hopefully will, will go through. If they do, likely to pay, play Netherlands again. Could, could there be a, a glimmer of hope that they might go one step further? With Wales, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the good thing, um, this year uh, we've played Holland uh, twice. Yeah. And in both games... You it scored was, goals. Yeah, it was actually the second, mm -hmm. the, the, all the reserves, really, against Holland. And we just narrowly lost, <laughs> you know? And that was in the last two minutes, in both games, coincidentally. So... It, um, then you add, you know, our best team and you're going up against Holland in a major tournament with us going and saying, yeah, we've got nothing not? to lose. We're coming at you. <laughs> and that's what Wales is. They'll, they'll come at you and they'll try and find a way. So That's bearing in mind that that's, that's presuming that Wales come second and Holland win their group. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you look at the, the, the Group A with Qatar, the Netherlands, Senegal and Ecuador. You'd think it was going to be the Netherlands and Senegal that come out. And if it's England and Wales, depending on which order it is, Senegal or the Netherlands is not going to be an easy game for either of those countries, our countries, mm. in the last 16. And then potentially the winner of our group is going to play France in the quarterfinals. So if any of us are going to do any good this year, it's going to be a tough route. Yeah. Could be painful if Wales go further than England, couldn't it? It will be if they do, yeah, <laughs> definitely will be. Right, enough about England and Wales and uh, the pain that might be. But yeah, I mean, uh, you made a great case for Wales and, and they can certainly score goals. So exci really exciting for Wales fans, I think, this year. One to be in there, but in there scoring goals against top teams is, is great for them. We'll, we'll move on and take a look at Brazil market leaders um, outright for the tournament. Their group, you'd probably argue, slightly easier. Serbia, Switzerland, Cameroon. There could be a top goal, uh, you know, a golden boot coming from this Group stage alone, couldn't they? Um, sorry, which team did you say? Brazil. Brazil. Um, yeah, I mean, when you look at Brazil, and I, I, I've always been a fan of Brazil. I think it's probably everybody's second favourite team, you know, in every World Cup. But So I always look at uh, Brazil and who they have. The only worry for Brazil right now is Neymar. He's, he's, not, he's been in and out. He's struggling with a little bit of fitness. He's not 100%. Uh, otherwise, I would say he's he's always going to be there. He's always scores goals for Brazil. Yeah, he's always a difference maker, uh, the magic man uh, to say. So I think um, I think Brazil will do well. You know, I, I really fancy them. I think this their strength is defensively. They've actually been very good in qualifiers. You know, so defensively, not known uh, for Brazil to be defensively strong, but defensively it gives them a platform to go forward. And they, you know, Neymar, Richarlison. Jesus, and you've got all of these players that can score goals. So they'll be dangerous, but um, I also worry for them, uh, for, for Brazil, because I think there's a lot of pressure on them. I think probably the most pressure they've had in 20 years mm -hmm. in, it will be in this World Cup. Firmino can't even make the squad. That shows the quality that they've got in this mm -hmm. team. 
I mean, defensively, you look at the goalkeeper, possibly one of the best goalkeepers in the world, Danilo, Thiago Silva, Casemiro, Manchester United. We've all seen what form he's in. He's been a difference for me at Manchester United. Yeah. And then you look at them going forward with Paqueta, Rafinha, Richarlison, the options that they've got. Look at their forward six, seven. It challenges the likes of Argentina and France. I think they're the only three teams that have got that abundance of attacking quality. But like you quite rightly said there, you look at the group they're in, the Golden Boot winner could be coming from there. There's a lot of value in the Golden Boot this year because it's such a closely fought market. You look, I think the, the, the value is looking at who the top players are, where they're playing in the groups mm. and what teams they're playing against. Yeah, they've certain, they certainly could be some goals. And, and the reason we all love watching Brazil is for that flair and those goals and in against some teams like that. I'm sure it'll make for some great football. Top, top price outright and... 20 years since winning it. It's an interesting one, isn't it? And I think that probably does add to the pressure because the expectation is there. What we know about Brazil is there, but they haven't done it in a long time. Yeah, they haven't done it in a long time. And is this now the tournament that Brazil actually do it? First yep. time in 20 years. They've probably got a great squad, great defence and all of that. We talk about that. Uh, but I wonder if the pressure on Brazil... Uh, is going to catch up to them. That's the only thing. But I actually, I, I feel in myself that they'll be able to do well and uh, I think they'll get pretty far. I mean, when you talk about goal scorers, I, you know, I look at the likes of Harry Kane, Mbappe, uh, Neymar, if he plays, and he plays fully. Um, and um, the other one I look at is uh, somebody like a Memphis Depay. I think he, for Holland, he's different, always scores goals. Maybe he's an underdog for like that top goal scorer. So I look at the one, I think the ones who um, can get, a, a, you know, somebody on a good run. And the other one, of course, we have to mention Lionel Messi as uh, one of the top goal scorers. I feel like he'll be strong and um, might be his last World Cup as well. But I, I think, will be, won't it? I can't yeah. believe that Brazil haven't won it for 20 years, though. When you look at that, mm. you know, back to 2002, the last time that Brazil won it. Yeah, it's um, unbelievable, football, right? a nation like that. And like you say, you never think of the added pressure that goes with that. We all put pressure on our national team. But you, it's, that comes from every country in the world. So they're going to Qatar with huge pressure on the shoulders to win it. Brazil, huge pressure, but huge expectations that come from their top quality. Here's Tim Vickery with his view on Brazil. Oh, they're flying, especially last year and a half. 15 games, 12 wins, three draws, no defeats, 38 scored, five conceded. Almost like the problem is that things have gone too well. They haven't been under pressure. We don't really know how they're going to react to pressure in the knockout stages of the World Cup. But it looks like the best, most attractive Brazil side for some time. They weren't far off four years ago. They're better this time. They are a serious, serious threat to winning this World Cup. It has to be Neymar. Uh, it looks like he's going to uh, overtake Pelé as Brazil's all-time top scorer in the course of this tournament, which will be sacrilege for some. Pelé, when he left the international scene, he was almost exactly the same age as Neymar is now. Pelé left the scene having done it all. Neymar has to do it all in this tournament. The pressure on him is going to be immense, but he's well prepared. He's fit. He seems to be psychologically in the right place. It's his moment. Well, with Brazil, most of them are household names anyway. I'm going to give you one. He's not going to start, but if they're chasing the game, he could be an option to come off the bench. He's a big centre forward, still plays in Brazil, called Pedro. Uh, he's not quick, but in the penalty area, he's a great finisher and he's got terrific technique and terrific awareness. He's one, he had a little go with Fiorentina a couple of years back. He only had four games, but he could be back in Europe and he's certainly one to watch when Brazil are chasing the game. Neymar, 75 goals in 121 appearances for Brazil. The best of the best. And Phil thinks he is the best. <laughs> Where do you weigh in with Neymar? Well, listen, as a player, if, if I was Neymar, I would be feeling exactly the same. Because you know, you've got to have that confidence. You don't become a great player without that confidence of feeling, yeah, I, I am the best. I am one of the best. Um, I think he, he very much knows he's not quite the best because he, he outwardly says that Lionel Messi is the best player I've lived. <laughs> so he says that himself. So, um, but what I do love about Neymar is I think he's handled a, a lot for a young man throughout his whole career since he was 16, 17, coming through. And every time he plays for Brazil, he's the one that handles all the pressure and also delivers, by the way. He, he scores goals. I mean, he's 75 goals in 121 games is... It, for Brazil, uh, is 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 not to be uh, you know just to be quiet about. So um, the worry with Neymar is, I think he 2014 he was brilliant until he got injured. 
but that's the best we've seen in, in a few games in a World Cup with Neymar. Um, so I think this is a this is a World Cup for Neymar. I think it, for him to be one of the best, one of the best Brazil players ever. I think this is this is a tournament that he's got to prove it, and he's got to score goals and come out and and be uh, exuberant like he always does. What do you think? It's a statement World Cup for him. I think he's got to make a statement here if he wants to be classed as one of the best. He is that there's a side to his game, the theatrical side to his game, the you know the his personality on the field, which I think he's worked on and he's changed. And I think for him to get to that level now, I think this is a big World Cup for him, like it is for Brazil. And I think he play a huge part in them winning this tournament, if they do. We touched on uh, the fact that Brazil can score goals in their groups. Above Neymar in the goal scorer bettings, only Benzema, Mbappe and, and Harry came for England. Benzema and Mbappe looking at France, uh, defending champions. They'll be the only team to do it in, I think, 60 years. Maybe not the form they'd like coming into this, but off the back of... Um, the last World Cup, they got to be, the quality they've got, they've got to be serious contenders, haven't they? What a squad they've got. You look at the squad of players that they've got and they're missing Pogba and Kante as well in this World mm -hmm. Cup, which will be a big miss for them because of the way they play. Those two are pivotal because the front six, the front, whatever he plays, five, those two or one, whichever one plays as an anchor, allows the front players to do the business. You look at the defensive quality they've got. The, the thing for me with the French squad is the age and the strength and depth, the age of that squad the development of the players that they bring through. I can't for the life of me think why Deschamps has only picked 25 players when he could pick 26. It's very it's, weird. But that's <laughs> just him and that's with the French squad. The problem for me with the French squad is they'll self-implode at some point. Mbappe will moan that nobody passed to him mm -hmm. or Griezmann. Some, some, there'll, there'll be some unrest in the squad. The hardest thing that Didier Deschamps has got is keeping all those players happy. Normally it's quite easy to keep 11 players happy because you pick them. Not with this French squad. They'll fight amongst themselves on the field. Mm. The quality, the talent is undoubted. And I think, rightly so, they're one of the favourites for this tournament. And I think they're the strongest team coming do out you of Europe. Think that, do you think they can win it? I think they can win it without a doubt, yeah. yeah. Harmon is one of the biggest things for me in the French squad. It's yeah. how he man manages those players. You know as well as I do, when you play in an international squad, now there's 26 people and there's a, a staff of, say, 40 people. So you're forced to live in a hotel with 50 to 60 people that you wouldn't necessarily choose to live with, spend 24 <laughs> hours a day with people that you wouldn't necessarily choose to, and with the egos, the characters in this French squad, it'll be interesting to see if they're all happy after four weeks of spending time together on the training pitch, in the dressing room, at the hotel, however it may be. The hardest thing for this French squad is harmony. If they're harmonious, if he gets a system, if he gets them playing well, they'll be very, very tough to beat, and they'll be up there with Argentina and Brazil. In the final? Or... Yeah, every chance, yeah, yeah, every chance, without a doubt, yeah. So it's people's to gauge like a success for England. What's a success for England? If England get to the quarterfinals and lose to France, who eventually win the tournament, you can't really complain because France have the ability to win mm. this tournament. Top quality, almost too much quality, you've said there, Paul. It's a tough one to manage, isn't it? You, you need those figureheads of your team that everyone can look to and, and to guide the team. There's almost too much quality that... There isn't one standout player or one man who's in charge. There's no kind of voice for them all to follow. <laughs> They'll all chip in and, and hopefully goes well. But as you said, it could end up with them all getting on each other's nerves. Yeah, I mean, anything, any team that um, in now these days, um, you have to have a, a good feeling, a good mm. environment. It's, it's a big part. When you're sometimes, you know, you're training and you're arguing and, every, you know, in the hotels and... All of these things are going on behind the scenes. It doesn't create a World Cup winning team uh, generally. So uh, with France, the, the worry is Kante. Kante is missing. If you look at the last World Cup, they won it because, and every player said that Kante was the, was the link. He's the one that got everybody else uh, out of trouble. And they weren't great, but they went and won the tournament. Now they're missing that guy. So... Um, I, mean, I look at um, also, you know, how is the tournament going to be? I think the tournament is going to be about who scores the most goals. They've um, got the danger men for that, haven't they? Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I look at Mbappe. And They've got two of them, yeah. Benzema. Mm. Two of them are, are in the top three favourites for the golden boot. Yeah, mm. Mbappe's brilliant. But he's also yet to prove himself, by the way. Because I think there's a... There's a people just talk about Mbappe like he's, he's done it. He's also got to prove himself because he's not really done it at the major tournament. Uh, Benzema is the one that I think now is... is he just, he's just on a different level this last few years and he's mm. getting the recognition. Um, Ballon d'Or winner, of course, this year. So he's going to be feeling great. So he's the main man, I think, uh, is Benzema. 
um, because every big game in Clásicos at Real Madrid, he always does it, always delivers, and every manager always picks him because there's something special about it. The thing for me with the French side as well, I want to ask Robert's opinion on this, because from a goalkeeping point of view, I think Hugo Lloris isn't at the best in the best of his form. I think you look at him at Tottenham, you look at him with his feet, there's mistakes in him this year. Last year I thought he was outstanding, but I don't think he's picked that form up this year. Do you think there's maybe a, a, a slight weakness there in the French goal? I agree, yeah, mm. I agree, because I don't think he's at the top, top level mm. like he was a couple of years you ago. You look at the rest of the players, you compare him to Alisson, Edison, those yeah. type of goalkeepers. I don't put him in that bracket. No, I, I think he's nowhere near that, mm. that bracket, because you look at Edison and Alisson, I think they, they, they've got to be the top two. Yeah. And I look at uh, the French and I think, OK, um, if you're a forward, if you're like a Brazil and a Neymar, you're going to be looking at, okay, the goalkeeper, you know, where's his vulnerabilities? Mm. I feel, because part of it as a goalkeeper is that uh, fear factor, you know, the Alison, presence. Yeah, the, the presence, presence yeah. The, <laughs> the being able to make the forward think twice. Mm. Um, and I think Loris doesn't really do that. Mm. You look at Loris and everybody, if you go at a 1v1, you just think, yeah, I'll either go around him or, <laughs> or round him or, or pass it around him. And you don't feel that fear factor. So I think um, he's not at his best and that might be somewhere where everybody else cap uh, capitalises on. France, a massive chance um, and, and definitely chances for the, the Golden Boots. We said in there, big, big names, big goal scorers. Um, looking at Argentina, that was... Was it your, your favourite for the, for the tournament, yeah. Robert? Um, obviously on an unbeaten run of 35 games, winning against Brazil... They're coming into this with some serious form. Messi, best player in the world. Um, the team kind of geared towards getting the most out of Messi. And Paul, you touched this will probably be the last time that he does play for his country in a World Cup. They've got to have a huge chance, haven't they? Yeah. What I love about Argentina is they won the Copa America. Um, they went then that game against Italy, uh, the, the Euros winners versus the Copa America winners. I thought it was unbelievable. And you got to see the levels. Mm -hmm. Because Italy has Euro winners and everybody thought, yeah, Italy, they were great. They deserved to win the Euros. And you think, yeah, of course, they were probably top two best in Europe. And then they came up against Argentina and got destroyed 3-0 mm -hmm. easily. And it mm -hmm. could have been five or six. And Messi was unplayable in that game. And you think those are the levels. That's the, that's the real top class, world class level. And I, I look at Argentina and think, um, if everything goes right, and uh, there's no mistakes or luck that happens. I think, for me, that they're the favourites with Lionel Messi, the genius. He's, you look at, you look at so Argentina good. and you look at Brazil and you, you look at the other favourites in the tournament, like England. You look at Argentina and their group, Mexico, Poland, Saudi Arabia. You don't even question they get out of that group. <laughs> Whereas England was sat and made a case, oh, they might get out, they might struggle in this. You look at Argentina, you look at Brazil, Switzerland, Serbia, Cameroon. They get out of the group. They get into the last 16, they get to the quarters because that's what they're doing. The quality that they've got is too much. And I think when you get to the latter stage of the tournament, that's where the quality will, will really come to the top. You make a good point there. For whether it's because we're English or the track record of England, there's many question marks in, in almost every game in our group stage. You look at Argentina and as you said, it's a walkover, it's isn't a given. it? It's it a given. is. They get out of the group. It's yeah. an absolute as, given. As group winners. And there'll be goals scored and it'll be easy, it'll be finessed. Where... Can they come unstuck when they go against the better teams? Because that's a relatively easy group and, and we're all in agreement that it's job done. But when they do come up against better teams, where might Argentina come unstuck? I think maybe sometimes they... Because how Argentina plays, sometimes they'll, they'll play man for man. You know, they'll play their tactics, but they'll, sometimes they'll play a man for man. And sometimes those, that makes the difference in, against the top teams. You know, for example, you look at their midfield. The top, their midfield is full of uh, engine type of players. They're the ones who, they'll get it, they'll pass it, but the number one role is they'll break everything up rather than pure creativity where thread, they're threading passes through. They're not so much like that. So I think maybe they're in the midfield and, um, and the, I think probably mistakes being out of position. Uh, that's probably the areas that Argentina can lose it, really, because I look at the defence and uh, um, Martinez at Man Manchester United, everybody was saying he's t too small and all of the this negative, he's been one of the best in the Premier League. And, um, and you look at Romero at Tottenham as well, exactly. defensively robust, defensively sound. I think the quality they've got in midfield with the Paul in there, like Brulee say, breaking up. They'll be so hard to beat Argentina. Mm. If they get the ball to Messi, they create as well. 
I really find it hard to make a case against Brazil and Argentina. Do you think Argentina really can win it? Yeah, yeah. for you? Well, I, I've got them as favourites. Realistically, what about you? listen, if, if somebody's given me three £10 bets, it's going on France, Brazil, Argentina. Yeah. Without a doubt. There we are. Argentina, very, very strong unanimously and in the betting. Unbeaten in 35 games. It is hard to make a case against them. Here is Tim Vickery, once again, our South American expert on Argentina. That unbeaten record is a little bit of a worry, you know, because uh, they keep thinking things are going to go wrong, you know, at the moment when, when, when uh, we, we, it's most important. But they're flying as well. Um, it, it is, I think, Messi's best crack at winning the World Cup ever because he's got a terrific team around him, a team around him that works, that work the ball so well in midfield. Although the loss of Giovanni Lo Celso is a serious blow. He's got a sweet thing going with Messi. He's one of Messi's key supply lines. I wonder a little bit how their defensive unit is going to hold up in the business end of the World Cup, but they are flying. They are very, very confident. And just like Brazil, you know, Argentina are in it to win it. Lionel Messi in the last... Less than two and a half games, he scored nine goals. It's an incredible statistic. And this bears out one of the golden rules in football. The team makes the stars. Now, Argentina's sides in the past, plan A was give the ball to Messi and pray. Plan B was to give the ball to Messi and pray. And there was no plan C. Now, with that midfield, they're getting the ball to Messi closer to the opposing goal where he can do something to hurt the opposition. They've got to work out how they're going to replace Lo Celso. I wonder if it might be Enzo Fernandez, who just joined Benfica this season from River Plate, looks so confident, so classy, and he's one of those players who, when it's tough, he seems to like that most. So Enzo Fernandez of, of Benfica is one that you may not know, but you may, may well know after the World Cup. Plenty of names that are going to be scoring goals at the World Cup. We've run through already how it came for England, Mbappe, and Benzema, Neymar, Messi, all of these top players popping up. But there's got to be some value elsewhere as well. There's got to be players that we haven't mentioned outside of the obvious ones. Give me a, a few names that you're already thinking about that have got a chance of banging some goals in, especially early on in these group stages, gents. Well, I look at um, probably one of the teams that I look at and think, OK, they probably should be in more of a thought. Um, I look at somebody like Lukaku, not mentioned a lot recently, but what does he do always internationally? He scores goals. So I think somebody like him would be a, a, a good bet. Um, and, you know, maybe somebody like uh, Germany, don't get a mention. Mm -hmm. Havertz is being scored on goals for Germany as well. He's somebody the way you think he might, you know, might score two or three in, in the group stages and then all of a sudden you get on a run. So you never know. What, what do you There's think? value in there. There's definitely value in there. You look at the goal scorers markets, the obvious ones are there, but there's still even value in the obvious ones. You pick out Messi at 12 to 1. I mean, that's not a bad price for Messi at 12 to 1. Mm. I like, like I said to you earlier, I look at the group that they're in. Messi's group, Mexico, Poland, Saudi Arabia. He's going to score goals and then he will score goals going forward in the tournament. And Benzema as well. You look at the group that France are in, Denmark, Tunisia, Australia. Might be more difficult against Denmark. But Benzema and Messi, for me, at the top of the market, they're two that are worth, worth having a couple of quid on. Somebody with a bit more value, I like Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne is at 50 to 1. Listen, this is the last of the golden generation, if you like, for Belgium. As Robert just said, they're going to look to go deep in the tournament with Lukaku. De Bruyne, set plays, free kicks, potential penalties within games creativity, he gets himself in the areas. We see him score week in and week out in the Premier League. So De Bruyne at 50 to 1, I think is excellent value. And another one at 50 to 1 is Luis Suarez. Mm -hmm. We know the Uruguayers are not going to be that strong, but I think you look at the quality of player that he is, they're in a group with South Korea and Ghana. Suarez at 50 to 1 against South Korea, Ghana, may get a couple of goals if they The if other they get one through. as well in the same team is Darwin Nunes. Nunes, He's Suarez. He's 50 to 1 too. 50 to 1, those two type of players. You look at that group, they're with Portugal, South Korea and Ghana. You'd fancy them to get through the group. Mm. Suarez and Nunes will score goals in that group. If they get through to the last 16, they may get a couple more. So at 50 to 1, Suarez, Nunes and De Bruyne, there's a lot of value to be had. You're trying to weigh up, aren't you? The quality of players, but also versus the groups that they're in, who they're going to play against and how far they might go. So from, I mean, from what we've chatted, you'd probably be looking at your Argentina top players, you your need Brazil to top bag, players. You a hatful in, in the group stages. Yeah. You look at the opposition in the group stages, you hope they play every game and you hope they score a load in the group stages. If they get, somebody gets through the group stages having four or five goals under the belt, they're well on the way. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I mean, listen, I think you, 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 you're always looking at around six 
to seven goals mm. is roughly uh, you've got to be a big, big favorite. But if you score, especially in that first game, you bang in a couple and then next game, maybe you get one. Because what the other thing as well for forwards is about confidence as well. You know, mm. who's coming into the tournament confident, who starts off confident in their group games, bangs in a couple of goals and then they fly in. We'll uh, take a look now at the market for top goal, goal scorer for the World Cup. Who will be the top tournament goal scorer in Qatar 2022? Well, Harry Kane is top of the pile. He did it four years ago, of course, and he's 7 to 1. And for me, I think it's a cracking bet. A quarter of the odds first four with Iran, Wales, and USA in the group stages. Surely he's going to get on the score sheet a few times, and that could be enough to certainly get a place. I think he's a play at 7 to 1. What about Kylian Mbappe? 8-1 to one for the French forward to be a top goal scorer. Karim Benzema is in there at 10-1 to one also for the French. Lionel Messi and Neymar, two huge names from South America, are in there at 12-1. to one. Cristiano Ronaldo is at 16-1. to one. It's 20-1 to one bar. We've got Thomas Muller for Germany. He won it in 2010. Harry Kane won it in, in 2018. Who will score the most goals at the FIFA World Cup in Qatar in 2022? Well, your top four in the betting, as Matt just said, Harry Kane, Mbappe, Benzema, Neymar. You said there are, is value to be had, but the obvious names will be in there. Can we try and nail down a one, two, three, four, at least, or at least four names that are going to be up there from each of you? I'll give you the first two. Maybe you can see, <laughs> see, see Paul can you elaborate with some, with some 50 to I'm going, for, I'm going for Messi. I think Messi will be on fire in this World Cup. Um, and I think he's going to be top scorer for me. The other one I pick is Benzema. You've that's, got I've anybody got else? Then my first two. <laughs> yeah, Rob wanted to yeah. get in early then. No, no, no that's good. Yeah. No, no, maybe he's got somebody else. Messi, Benzema. Yeah. Um, I like Lukaku, like you said, I didn't think of that one. But yeah. I, like I said to you, Suarez and De Bruyne is value. But I think if you're looking actually at the top markets, Mbappe, he's got to be up there. And I think one we've not talked about, we've obviously not talked about Harry Kane as well. Harry Kane's got to come into people's thoughts. Yeah. And Lewandowski, the fact that he plays for Poland is why he's not up there in mm. the top of the market. But if Poland get a decent run in the groups, he's going to score. He's got to be up there. So let's go Messi, Benzema, Mbappe and Harry Kane for me. Yeah. There we are. Four names to look out for. Um, quickly, we'll just touch on Germany because we haven't. And, and this is probably the most interesting group of the lot, or in, in my opinion anyway, with Germany and Spain in there. That's where you're going to get the, the juiciest clash early on. If they get through that group, which I'd imagine you both agree they probably should get out of it, 11 to 1 outright. It's not never a bad rule, price. Never rule the Germans out in tournament football. Mm. I mean, they've, they've had their ups and downs over the years. With Hansi Flick now, you, you, you know they're going to be well organised. You know they're going to be hard to beat. And they've got that bit of creativity in there. Musiala, what a player he is. Mm. He's, going to, he's going to be a fantastic at this World Cup. I think he's, with his assists, with his creativity, just gives them that something else. I think they're lacking out and out goal scorer. And number nine is their main problem. Defensively, they'll be robust. And they know how to handle tournament football. Mm. Never rule them out, but I don't put them as one of the favourites. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's weird. Uh, Germany, probably the lack of talk about Germany is, is very weird because mm. big tournaments, you, you normally always straight away think Germany. But I think this is probably, they're going into it and thinking we're now the underdogs. And mm. I think they will be the, the biggest underdog. I think them and Belgium are going to be the, the two biggest underdogs. Uh, the, the problem with Germany is that not a, they've always traditionally always had a great goal scorer but they haven't. They've got lots of really good attacking players, yeah. but not finishers. We touched there on confidence. If Germany could beat Spain, that would kind of be a vote of confidence that the old Germany or, or the top-class Germany that we know are here. They've beaten Spain. They should do the rest of the group, and that would surely play into when they hit another top team in, you know, beyond the group stages, wouldn't Listen, it? They're not a bad team. They're a good team. You look mm. at the players they've got. I like Robert says, I just think they're like that focal figure up front. You look at the team, they've got Rudiger, you know, Gundogan, Sane, Havertz, Kimmich. They've got a very, very good team, an experienced team, an experienced team in tournament football. Um, they get on a run, they will be hard to beat. We know that they're going to be hard to beat. It will be them and Spain that you would think would get out of that group, but Uruguay could be the ones to cause a problem in that group. South Korea at the moment, they're not in good form. Um, so it'd be, sorry, that's the, the Portugal group. But I think it will be tough for Germany once they get through to the last 16, because I think there's teams that are better than them. When they get to the last 16, the quarterfinal, I think that's probably where it ends for Germany in the quarterfinals. What do you, I, I mean, I know thinking about Germany, um, I always think about the mentality. Mm -hmm. I think they can handle 
going up levels yeah. and handling big tournaments with game management. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's how much do you think that's a big factor? It's huge for yeah. them and experience from the manager and the players as well. They know how to play big games and they know how to play tournament football, which has always been a benefit for them. We've talked Germany as potentially being overpriced, or if if not overpriced, at least a danger if they do get going. As we look at the market, we've spoke about the, the obvious selections, but is there a country that stands out as being overpriced? And again, if they if they get out of the group and they get on a roll, you think could outrun their odds? Overpriced. Mm. Overpriced, sorry, not underpriced. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few. I mean, there's, there's a clear favourite in every group. If you look at the, you look at the groups, you, you can mark a clear favourite. We've not even spoke about Croatia. You look at the quality that they've got in their team. Croatia are a team that could come up on the rails. If I agree with that one, group, by the way. That's, yeah. that's the team that I thought, uh, they might be underdogs. Um, I think they also got a very good team as well. So No one wants to play them in the knockout stages. Yeah. You mm. look at the experience, they get Brozovic, Modric, Vlasic, Kovacic, Perisic. They've got an experienced team and a quality team. Aging team, defensively they're susceptible, but I think Croatia could be one to watch. Yeah, I, th I think the one that I, I, I looked at the odds and I'm thinking, OK, how are they that high up? I think probably because the individuals rather than the team, I look at Portugal. Mm. I think Portugal will, will struggle. I, I, I might even go as far as say Portugal might struggle to get out of the group. Mm. Um, you know, so Portugal, I think probably, I, I would not pick them above Croatia, Belgium, Holland even. I would pick those three ahead of Portugal. Interesting. A, a flop maybe from yourself, Paul? There's potential on a lot of fronts. I think there's... For, Don't say England. You, you, you can make a case for England. I know, you yeah, can I know. make a case for England. And I think the, the pessimistic side of you can from an English point yeah. of view, simply because of the lack of form going into the, the tournament, the lack of identity in the Nations League games, the rotation of players, the question mark of are we going to play with a three, are we going to play with a four, we still don't know, the fitness of players. England could potentially fall into that category. But then you look around also, I mean, you look at Holland, Netherlands, Senegal, they've got expectation with them. I think for me, Portugal, like Robert said, they've got so many individuals, but as a team, they could flop. And the circus that is now Ronaldo, that's following him around, Mm. Nobody's going to be talking about Portugal now. Everyone's going to want to talk to Ronaldo and about Ronaldo. And that could become a bit of a media circus, like it has been at Manchester United. So I think realistically, that if you're looking for a really big name to flop, it could be Portugal, because that's a tough group, even though South Korea aren't playing particularly well. Underdogs, potential flops, goal scorers. We've talked throughout all of it. And at the start of the show, you both mentioned who you think might go the distance. To nail you both down, as Betfred are, best price on all outright bets for the competition, your team to win the 2022 World Cup? Um, it's hard for me to not bet against Argentina. Argentina for Robert? Brazil. But if you've got a spare fiver floating around in the car somewhere, stick it on Denmark, because <laughs> they are well organised and hard to beat. Brazil the favourites, but a sneaky side bet on Denmark, or at least cash out when they get to the quarterfinals. Brazil for Paula, and if you do find a fiver, then Denmark's the, the value bet. Thank you very much to both of you for your expert opinions, as always. And as mentioned throughout the show, Betfred, best price um, on outright betting for the World Cup. Thanks again. Top stuff, gents. Whoever you're backing to win, get our top prize, guaranteed. Play in-store and online with Betfred.